This is video two of the spinal lecture. If you missed the first one, click on the little eye in the top corner here, it'll send you back over to that video. But when we left off last, I was looking at the um, Asia scale here, uh, which is the international classification standard for um, classifying spinal cord injuries. We'll do a lot more of this in neuro, so don't worry about it now. So I'm gonna go ahead and shut that video down for me in the corner, I'll be back in a minute. So what's the difference between myotomes and dermatomes? Well, myotomes are simply muscles. So when we're looking at motor control due to spinal cord, we look at our myotomes. You will eventually memorize these, but not now. So to check the myotome, we're gonna look at levels of the spinal cord. So to check C5, we need to check elbow flexors, and then wrist extensors for C6, and moving on down the line. Again, don't worry about memorizing those yet. You have plenty of time to do that in neuro. Then we have our sensory. This is the dermatome. So if you look over here on the picture, it even shows you. If you're checking C5 dermatome for sharp uh, touch, soft touch, two-point discrim, that's where you're going to check. All right? And you'll see here, if you remember the hand dermatomes, it's a little different than some of the others. That's why I'm never going to ask you the like where the middle finger is on the dermatome. There's too many random answers all over the place. That's really the difference between your myotomes and dermatomes. We will come back to this uh, later for sure. So now let's dive into the muscles. So easy muscle, rectus abdominis, flexes that spine. Everybody knows that. Also though, it's going to posteriorly tilt the pelvis. And then we should know if we posteriorly tilt the pelvis, we have reduced Whoops. What? Lordosis. If we've reduced the lordosis, what are we doing to the discs and the intervertebral foramen? That's your question to think about. What's happening? That's the process we need to be able to go through. So rectus, easy. Other questions in terms of at least the action, but the external versus internal obliques are a lot tougher. So. I will show you up in the corner. I'm going to demonstrate quickly how you can, I think, easily answer a question about which one of those contracts on which side to rotate to the right, for example. So watch up in the video. If you take your hands for your external obliques, like you're putting them in your pocket, so making a V. So let's make a V here. This is your external obliques. Then I'm going to take my other hand. I'm going to slide it underneath for my internal obliques. So this is what it looks like. So if I contract my right hand, which is my external oblique, so I'm gonna move my internal out of the way. If that happens, it's gonna pull me to the left. So my right external oblique is going to rotate me to the contralateral side to the left. So then if I wanna to rotate to the left, we have right external oblique. If we put that internal in here, Internal is going to rotate you to the same side. So to rotate to the left, I need right external and I need left internal oblique. So just take those hands like this. This is your external obliques. Slide that internal underneath and you got the ultimate cheat sheet every time. So practice that a little bit because I guarantee there'll be a question or two about if I rotate to the left or the right, which one of those or which ones of those are contracting to make that happen. Thoracolumbar, uh, or sorry, <laughs> thoracolumbar. Uh, transverse abdominis. So this is a big one for core stabilization. This is when you hear people say activate your TA or really tighten that core. This is what we want. You can look at this and just see how this muscle when it tightens is like a corset, keeping everything stabilized. Now we'll talk more again about how to activate this specifically next term but, and in neuro, but um, we need to understand that it's called the drawing in maneuver. And that's the uh, technique to help activate the TA. So trying to draw that belly button up and in. And again, we'll talk more about that in term four, or you can check out the videos when they're posted finally for the musculoskeletal rehab class. That's your TA, super, super important for stabilizing that spine. You can see even how it connects to that 
fascia here for that lumbar spine, especially. So when you're doing all the body mechanics stuff and then other classes, uh, understanding the importance of activation of the TA. Another muscle we got is our quadratus lumborum. So we should be able to see how that's going to, if we only activate one side, it's gonna laterally flex to the same side. If both of these activate, it's gonna help with lumbar extension. So again, when we think about this, we need to put all of this together. If we extend the lumbar spine, what's that going to do to the IVF? We need to know that. So if you can't figure that out, ask me in the comments or send an email or something, because that's gonna help with treating patients later. Now, when we talk about the erector spinae, it's a group of muscles. There's a lot of different muscles. So you can say the erector spinae, you can try to divvy them out into your legitimus, your ilicostalis and spinalis. That's fine. But on exams, pretty much every question would just be your extensors. It's just all one big group. I don't know how you really uh, isolate and take one out. If you extend the spine, you have to activate all of these. What I think is important to, is to understand how many, and this is just one layer of spinal extensors, how much uh, musculature we have to promote that extension, okay? Because we have all those joints, we have a lot of different connections. And then we have the multifidi, which kind of did out of order, should have done them with the internal and external obliques, but the multifidi are going to do what the external obliques do, which is rotate to the contralateral side. And I wanna show you how that works here. So on the back side between your transverse process and spinous process, you'll see that multifidi. So we should be able to follow that line of pull down here. So if it's on this transverse process above and the spinous process below, it's going to pull, when it contracts, it's going to pull, I lost my draw here, it's gonna pull the transverse process or the spinous process laterally just a tad. So if that happens here, the anterior portion is gonna to move to the right. So to rotate to the right, we should be able to do three muscles. Whoops, <laughs> two, three. Number one, to rotate to the right, we need the left external obliques. We need the left multifidi, and we need the right internal obliques. We should be able to do that. And then that's just concentrically. We need to think about eccentric. So play around with concentric first in that concept and then add the eccentric concept to it later. Get back over to the notes, see where we're at here. Get caught up to talk about those muscles. Um, again, we bring back that muscle reverse muscle pull. We've talked about this before with the abdominals. The actual, let's go up here real quick so you can see this. The actual insertion for the rectus abdominis is the xiphoid process fifth through seventh ribs. So remember, normal muscle contractions is the um, going to be your insertion moving towards the origin. Okay, so that would be like doing a sit up. But if we curl our, if we think about the way we activate to do the uh, anterior pelvic tilt, that is going to be a reverse muscle pull because we're moving that pubis towards the xiphoid process. Just another example of reverse muscle pull. We talked about the quadratus lumborum. We talked about the multifidi. We talked about the erector spinae as a muscle group. You can pause here just if you want to see a little bit more detail, but your book has it as well. We talked about the transverse abdominis. We talked about the drawing in maneuver. We try to activate this to help keep that pelvis neutral. So once we find neutral spine, we activate the TA and it kind of helps um, solidify and stabilize that optimal position. Let's get into some very basics of pathologies here. So first DDD, that's degenerative disc disease caused by a growth of osteophytes. These are the things that start to grow, say in the intervertebral foramen that start to develop that stenosis. 
So, but over time, regardless of what's specifically happening with degenerative disc disease, it's pretty much like arthritis of the spine. So as we get older, we have a reduction in water or if we're not even drinking enough water, it's very important to stay hydrated. So now we have less space between the discs and we start to put more pressure on the facet joints, okay? So let's see, let's try to find a good picture of that. Back at the top here. Where was that at? We'll go to this one. So as we start to lose this disc here, oops, let's make it red. As we start to lose this disc, you're gonna have more pressure in the facet joints. That's gonna cause osteophyte growth, which is then going to start to close up that hole. And you can get osteophytes anywhere, anywhere where there's more bone on bone contact. And the reason they grow is because of the basic principle. Oh, we're like all over the place now. Somehow went to SCI, it's crazy. The basic principle of bone growth is what causes this. And that's Wolf's Law. Pretty much stating that bone is gonna grow where there's pressure and bone is going to stop growing where there's less pressure. So you think about your teeth, your heels, for example, uh, your heels are constantly with heel strike, bang, bang, bang. Their heels are really dense. Your teeth are really dense bones. So when someone has osteoporosis, that's why it's so important to encourage weight bearing exercises so that the patient can start to hopefully, because of Wolf's Law, at least try to maintain some bone density. However, it works against us when we have arthritis and we now have bone on bone because now the bone's going to grow more. Now we have those osteophyte developments or bone spurs and things like that. So in that, of course, then degenerative disc disease can lead to discs herniating, but also stenosis. And this is a narrowing of that hole, a narrowing of the IVF. And the patient will probably start to have a flex posture because that's going to feel better. However, that's bad for the discs. So again, we end up weighing the pros and cons of that. We'll talk more about forward head posture in the head neck uh, section, um, but this is a big one, a huge cause of multiple problems, and it really can help you see the domino effect of poor posture and what that does. So a major cause of this, working at a computer like me right now, reading, general poor posture, muscle imbalances. Okay, so what we're going to start to learn is which muscles are going to be tight, which muscles are going to be lengthened. And like I said, we'll talk more about that in the head neck one. So just understand this is our optimal posture, trying to retract and extend that cervical spine. And here we have that protraction of the cervical spine, which is our bad posture. And then we got our herniated discs. So just check out figure 832 in your book, or if you don't have this book, look in here. So we have the first and least aggressive is our protrusion. So you can see how that nuclear propulsus is pushing on that uh, fibrocartilage a little bit. So push here, might start to push out a little bit onto that spinal cord or nerve roots. Prolapse is when we now actually have some of the nucleus has escaped the uh, fibers of the fibrocartilage. Extrusion is even worse. And then the worst of all is sequestration, where now you actually have pieces of the disc that have completely left the disc. So there'll be probably just one question on the exam about this, but you should, if you wanna get that right, make sure you know the definitions of each of these. And if you look on that page, it literally tells you what they are. And I have them here, just a basic definition of that. So when you then start putting into the fact that you have the posterior longitudinal ligament helps to keep this stuff in and give us some support. It doesn't give us as much as the anterior, which is why we have more posterior um, disc herniations.
scoliosis, that abnormal curvature of the spine that can be seen in the frontal plane. That's technically how you're looking at it, that frontal plane curvature. And it's defined by the convex side. So if you have right side scoliosis, then if you're looking up from like the sacrum, the curve, this is the convex portion. That's why you have right side scoliosis. And it's even better if you define it by whether it's thoracic and stuff like that. So there's that guy there. So it's important to understand then too, if we have right side scoliosis, which muscles are gonna be tight, the left or the right side? The left side is going to have tight muscles. Whoops, I don't know why I wrote a four, but the left side will be tight and the right side will be overstretched. So that means we need to work on strengthening the right side and stretching out the left side. And definitely some cardiopalm issues if it works its way up towards the heart, because if, it comp if you have compression on this side, say the heart's in here, now we have compression. And we talked before about what compression does. Uh, if we, if we decrease the volume of an area, the pressure is going to increase. So if the pressure is higher in here now, it's harder for the heart to pump blood out and into the body. So now the heart has to work harder. And also you can't expand the lungs as much. So uh, if you don't remember the how pressure changes with volume, you can check that rib cage uh, lecture out because I talk very briefly about the physics of that and what's called like this is way more complex than just one basic thing, Boyle's Law. Discussing the relationship of pressure and volume and temperature as well. Another pathology we'll quickly go over, anterior spondylolisthesis. So you have a anterior displacement of L5 on S1. And a big no-no on this, we try to reduce, especially full extension is contraindicated. See if I have a picture of that guy. I do not have a picture of that, but pretty much L5 is sliding off the front of S1. So Google the picture or look it up in your book, but find that and you'll see very quickly how if you continue to extend that L5 would just pop right off. Then we have thoracic outlet syndrome, compression of the brachial plexus or the subclavian artery. So up in the shoulder and arm area. Check out that AdSense maneuver. That is a way to test to see if this is positive. And we'll talk, this is definitely gonna be an issue that's talked about in neuro specifically. And then because I've told you so much that I think you should have a pretty good understanding about a lot of this, you get to look up whiplash on your own. Plus there's a case study due for that as well. So uh, read uh, closely into whiplash because that'll be an important part obviously of the head and neck section. But I want you to take a dive at that and see if you can understand when you understand the cause of whiplash, how that affects uh, the spine and cervical spine specifically um, for our patients and what we need to work on. And that's the end of the basic spine. The next lecture is gonna deal on the head, neck, and uh, temporal mandibular joint or the TMJ joint. So yes, the neck is part of the spine, but uh, the book has divided it into two different sections. So next video we'll check out is going to be for the neck.